much of a free spirited. It was really ignorance. And I guess I wasn't really knowledgeable enough to realize the damage that I was doing um, as far as getting in debt and, and how that actually going to it would affect you. My, I, I mean, I never really had the concept of an emergency fund. Uh, so first, first of all, you got to have a goal set in mind, um, whether that is to retire in five years, 20 years, you know, say $500,000, a million dollars, $20 million, just have that goal and then create a plan on how you're going to get to that goal. But obviously the most important thing is to actually act upon that plan. A plan is not going to get anywhere if you don't act upon it. You're listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their current portfolio allocation. Now to your hosts, Clark Sheffield and Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires Unveiled podcast. This is episode number 275. Happy New Year to everybody out there. Hopefully you had a great New Year's. I know I did with the family. It's been a crazy couple of weeks here, I guess. Really weak with the travel, with the weather and Southwest Airlines and all sorts of cancellation. I know I had several people that were, that I know that were affected by that. And uh, hopefully we'll be getting back to some normal, some normalcy. And there's been quite a bit of snow out west which is great i think we need the water so hopefully that continues and and doesn't wreak too much havoc but uh yeah another year Uh, really excited for 2023 as i mentioned we've got a lot of great things in store uh, for the podcast and super excited about that we are coming up on our 300th episode here soon so once again we'd love to get uh, somebody with a net worth of 300 million if possible for that keep in line with the other ones we've done uh, we always learn something from those that have reached a little bit higher nether higher level of net worth also if you're interested to be on the show send us an email millionaires, millionaires unveiled at gmail.com and we'll get you set up here in, in the pipeline to be on the show this week we have Saul, his newly minted millionaire. He's got about four hundred twelve thousand in his retirement accounts between four hundred one k and IRA, thirty four thousand in cash, two hundred twenty seven thousand in home equity, and three hundred twenty nine thousand in his brokerage. He's in his late forties, and he works as an IT consultant. We get into all, all sorts of discussions with him about his dividend strategy and just his investment journey in general. He was one of those that for the longest time just looked at the checking account at the end of the end of the month and if he had some money great if not uh, oh well and uh, he lived kind of keeping up with the joneses and and really didn't have much of a plan until he got into his mid 40s so got a later start in in uh, his investment journey but great episode with Saul last week we had Brian he's in his late 30s he had three kids or has three kids rather uh, he's in sales after becoming a chiropractor he had a 1.3 million dollar net worth so without any further delay, let's get into this week's episode with Saul. Saul, do you want to just give us a little about your background and what you're up to now? Um, sure. So I'm 45 years old uh, and I am a principal consultant for an IT company. And uh, I'm basically, uh, since I found this whole concept of uh, financial independence, um, I started working on my plan towards it. And as we were discussing earlier, um, I just hit the one million mark in net worth uh, a couple of weeks ago. Awesome! Congrats! And how is the million broken up? Uh, so we have about four hundred and twelve thousand in retirement accounts. So that's including my current four hundred one k and my wife and my own IRA. Uh, we have right now about thirty four thousand dollars in cash on a money market account that I'm still. Um, contributing to it. I want to make it at least uh, double that. Uh, Home equity, I am counting that. And and the amount that I'm giving you already is contemplating um, fees and closing costs and all that. So home equity is about $227,000. And then we have a brokerage account that has $329,000. Okay. And is that money that's invested in the market? Is that basically in stocks, index funds? What's the breakup there? Yeah. So so the way I'm approaching it right now is um, I'm typically targeting uh, dividend paying ETFs uh, or ETNs or funds. 
And what I'm doing is I'm, I have my, my spreadsheet worked out. I've already identified either the ETFs or the funds or the stocks that I'm looking to invest. And I'm basically targeting the, the highest yield first. I'm trying to reach you know a, a threshold of, say, $30,000 on each holding. Once I meet that mark, I move on to the, to the next highest paying dividend that's on the market. So let's say the highest I have right now is about uh, 13%. The one after that is 11. So once I meet the 30K in the one that pays 13%, I start contributing to the one that pays 11% and so on. But it's primarily ETFs, uh, a few stocks, individual stocks, but primarily ETFs right now. Interesting. So has that always been the allocation in, in, in mindset towards your investing? No. Uh, before I had really no idea what I was doing. I mean, I didn't really start paying attention until probably two years ago. This time it was it was actually November. It was just before Thanksgiving when I I was basically just going with the flow. Uh, you know, higher salary meant buy more expensive stuff. You know, either trading your car or you know buy more furniture or replace furniture or anything like that. I wasn't really paying attention to to my finance finances. I wasn't really I didn't really have a plan for you know our income. I was just you know money that came in we would spend it in whatever. It didn't really it didn't really have a plan. Uh, but two years ago I started I started thinking about you know what am I going to do in retirement. What's retirement really going to look like? What's, what's what am I able to? What am I going to be able to do? And I basically just started browsing for you know retirement videos or podcasts, and I and I stumbled up upon a couple that retired when they were thirty. And my first reaction to that was, well, you know, who inherited them a bunch of money so that they could retire at thirty? You know, I think it was thirty five and thirty four, and and that just piqued my interest. And that's when I started to understand that my problem was I basically was ignorant when it came to finances. I, I had no idea how to how the market worked. I did have some some stock awards from my company, but I just let them be there. Like I wasn't really paying attention to any of that. Um, so so two years ago is really when I started learning and just you know reading, uh, checking podcasts, articles, and 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 I came up with a plan. And I started I started really analyzing if I really gave my money a plan, when am I going to be able to to be financially independent? Maybe not retire, but at least be financially independent where work becomes optional. So I came up with this plan with this spreadsheet where I'm forecasting, you know, up to life expectancy of over 90 year, 90 years old, uh, assuming the the returns that I'm seeing right now with my current allocations. You know, if I continue this plan, how are things going to look like? And and from that, I started looking at 2026 to be the earliest year that I could retire. But the way things have been moving, I've actually been able to see that maybe 2025 can be achievable. Um, so we'll see. I guess time will tell. Is it a specific number for you to get to that point? It's not. It's not really a specific amount. It's more of how much how much income that's going to be generating. So for me, as long as my essentials are covered, and by essentials I mean housing. Uh, basic services and utilities, so nothing fancy like no video streaming subscription, like that's not really essential. But let's say if I'm still going to be working, then a decent internet service is still going to be essential. You know, food, shelter, water, all, all those essentials, as long as those are covered, that's going to meet my expectations of being financially independent. And then anything extra is going to be really cherry on the top. Right now, those essentials are basically, because of the place that we live on, um, it, it's going to be close to five and a half, five, five thousand five hundred dollars a month, give or take. Uh, right now, my my brokerage account alone is generating about thirty three hundred dollars a month. So it's getting pretty close to that to that um, basic amount. But if if I wait until 2025, 2026, um, I'm basically covered for my current expenses, which includes more than just the essential cost of living. Interesting. So I want to read something that that you submitted just Mm -hmm. for our listeners. You know, it's interesting that, and I want to ask you a little bit about this, but you said, I never had money management in mind and pretty much every dollar that came in was spent without really thinking Mm -hmm. about it. Up until 2019, I didn't really have a retirement plan or it even looked at what retirement would look like for us. 2019 Mm -hmm. is when I learned about the FIRE movement and started to educate myself on taxes, investments, et cetera. So Mm -hmm. Saul, what was it about 2019 what 
Was there a specific event in that year that caused you to start thinking about this? And why, I mean, you were essentially well into your career at that point and you hadn't even thought about it. Mm -hmm. Why did that, why did it take that long or why, you know, what was the event that caused you to start thinking about it? I don't, I don't really know that there was an event. It was, it was just one of those days where I guess I just realized I was probably closer to retirement age than I was to when I started working. And, and I had actually, I read uh, after I, after I decided to start looking into, into finances and into that, that motion, I think the first book that I grabbed was your money or your time or your money or your life from Vicky Robin. And there was one, one of the steps and I can't re- remember which step it is, but it, it, it makes you go through basically your whole career how much money, you know, per year you made throughout. And then the question is, okay, what do you have to show for? And that's when I realized I, I mean, I had a lot of stuff that didn't really, wasn't really going to help. But I think that, I think that the pivot for me was basically that, that point in life where, where I realized, you know, retirement is, retirement age is getting pretty close. I guess I felt a time crunch maybe, but, uh, but it, it was, it wasn't really like a specific, like a personal event or anything like that. It was just me one day realizing, you know, retirement is closer to me than, than when I started working, I better have, I better have a plan. I better have, I better be prepared for it. And that's really what, what triggered it. Did you budget ever before that? Or I mean, what level (laughs) of interest in your finances did you have? Was it just, Hey, let's let's see if we have cash at the end of the month in the bank or what? It was, that was pretty much it. It was, you know, if at the end of the month, my checking account still has something, um, you know, it, it, there, there wasn't any overdraft like that was good enough for me. We did have um, back in 2000, I think it was 2007. My wife at that time was working in the mortgage industry. And through that through that line of work, she met with a financial planner. So we did have a, a meeting with a financial planner back in 2007. And I remember one of the first things he asked uh, or he where we went through was, you know, the, the whole cash flow, money coming in, money going out. And and that's when I realized, like, I had no idea how much money we were spending on on any of the various um, budget items. Like, I mean, I knew the mortgage because that's a very fixed amount. But, you know, eating out or food expenses, I had really no idea uh, how much money we were spending on that, how much money we were spending on transportation. I had no idea. Uh, I thought I knew and, and it didn't really work out. But even then, uh, it was 2007. It was pretty early in my in my working career that I just figured, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's gonna work out. I see everybody else doing the same thing I'm doing. So and they seem to be pretty pretty good. Um, so I didn't really pay much attention. In fact, that that initial session with that person with that financial advisor, I actually it it felt a little bit as a, as a personal attack because because I should know you know <laughs> I should know all these things and I didn't. And he was the one to point it out. In front of my wife, which I thought, I don't know, it, it felt like a like a personal attack on me not being able to understand or to know what those what those amounts were, which which it wasn't. But that's just how it felt to me. And I think that's probably why I dismissed it at that time. Uh, now, obviously, now knowing what I know now, I wish I had been paying a little bit more attention and, and acted upon that. So when you had that discussion, financial advisor, then 2019 happens where you start to, to take a little bit more interest in your money and money management. Mm-hmm. What was the conversation like with your wife as you both went through this at that? Yeah. So it was, it was interesting because I mean, I, I started crunching a bunch of numbers first and projecting and doing graphs and just looking at, you know, different options and, you know, what if we do this with, with this budget or, or what if we, you know, start investing instead of having, you know, a hundred plus K in a savings account. Um, so when I initially brought this up to my wife and said, Hey, you know what, if, if things, if things work out the way I think they will, based on what I'm, what I'm learning and what I'm finding out, um, you know, we might be able to be financially independent in, in five to six years. First thing she, she said was like, Oh, that's, that's never going to happen. You know, you're crazy. How can that be? We haven't been able to, uh, to, to be good with money for 20 plus years, what makes you think that in five years we're going to be able to, you know, be financially independent? So it did take a little bit of time. I had to show her like all my 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 numbers because she kept saying that I'd count money twice. And obviously back in 2007, that was the case. I thought we had, you know, less less expenses than 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 we actually did. So in a way, I guess I was counting money twice. Uh, but this time, like I made her go through my math and I sh- showed her everything. It did take a couple of sessions uh, with her probably four to five months 
obviously not every day, but maybe once a month, we would just go over like the monthly expenses and and show her that things were moving along like I was like I was expecting. And then she started getting on board. And uh, and and she's uh, every time now her her paycheck comes in, her first question is like, so what are you going to invest that in? Like, what is that going to? How much dividends is that going to generate? Uh, so so she's got she's got on board. We're we're both pretty excited about it now. And it's it's actually a pretty good place to be when both um, you know everybody or both in the couple they we both want the same we're both working towards the same goal that definitely helps so both want to retire early so i don't i it, two years ago i think i definitely wanted to retire early my wife not necessarily and and to be honest right now me i don't think i would necessarily retire completely um i probably take on a less stressful position uh, if that's an option or even you know change companies to a to a less stressful role uh still contributing uh, but i don't think right now I, I don't think the goal is to stop working as more as just being financially independent and and have that flexibility of if for whatever reason something happens and we decide we no longer want to work, you know, that's that's an option. Where do the dollars go to get you there? Do you keep putting them in the brokerage account or retirement accounts or which where does the first dollar that you're going to invest go first and second, third? So the first place it goes like what I try to do is max out my 401k because uh, we do get a pretty good match at work. Uh, we get basically 50% of the amount that you contribute. Uh, so exactly, you know, 50 cents on the dollar for every dollar. Now, I don't I don't wait until that happens. Uh, I basically just set my my paycheck to, to distribute that throughout the year. I do get a, a bonus paid out to me on September. So typically by, by September, I max out my 401k, but at the same time, I'm investing in the brokerage account. Uh, what I try to do is I, I have what I call the emergency fund. Uh, that's just basically um, to cover my maximum out of cost for health benefits, and that's $5,000. So as long as I have those $5,000 uh, available, anything extra that that is left behind after the end of the month, uh, considering 401k and, and retirement accounts um, contribution have been met for that month, then anything over the left 5,000 goes into that brokerage account. You'll continue that? No, no real estate. Oh yeah, that that keeps going. Uh, it's uh, it's it's where I've seen the biggest returns right now. Um, I mean, the 401k is actually doing pretty good. It's 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 pretty much close to what the S&P 500 is doing. Uh, the uh, the brokerage, like I said, it's I'm I'm focusing on the ETFs and it's high dividend uh, yield ETFs. So there's not a lot of growth in that overall year to date. As of today's close of the bell, I'm getting 12.3 percent uh, yearly in um, in dividend payments. And you just reinvest those? Yes. Yes. Those go right back into that um, list of ETFs or, or, or funds that I'm targeting. And then you pay taxes with cash in the bank that you have? Correct. Yeah, okay. I had to... Um, Part of my part of my learnings where, OK, I know this is going to mean, you know, I got to look at taxes. So I did plan ahead for taxes. I did have to readjust a little bit my my withholdings uh, for paycheck every uh, for every paycheck. So I did add a little bit more. Um, I understand I'm paying a little bit more taxes because some of the dividends are non-qualified dividends. But it's the way I see it. It's I'm paying I'm paying taxes on money that I wasn't going to have to begin with. So even if I have to to pay, you know, the 22 or 24 percent, depending on where that that amount of money lands as far as the marginal brackets, uh, it's it's money that I wasn't going to have regardless. So I don't see that as me paying taxes more than I see that more of uh, me getting money that I wouldn't have otherwise. So let's let's rewind here a little bit, Saul. Give our listeners a little bit more of your background. Where did you come from and maybe how your money or lack thereof, I guess, for so many years was shaped to the point that you, I mean, I don't know if you'd call yourself a free spirit, but no budget, just looking at the checking account, make sure you have enough cash in there every month. I mean, to some degree, I think a lot of us would love to live like that, right? <laughs> well, I guess uh, it it depends. I mean, it wasn't, it was, it was interesting. My, my first my first hit of reality with with money was back in 2000 when I had my first job. Uh, I had no idea about taxes because both my parents, um, I mean, we, we they're both teachers. We had we never had any any deficiencies, 
but there wasn't really any money you know, left over at the end of the month. Uh, and I think that's why there was really no, no conversations about money management because there was never any money to manage at the end of the month. So I didn't really learn anything of that. Um, I didn't even I didn't even realize about tax withholdings until my first paycheck when I was expecting well over what I actually got deposited. Um, and that's where really the trouble began for me as far as getting in debt, because I was able to get my bachelor's degree without uh, incurring any student loans. But that didn't matter because the uh, the spending did that for me. Uh, I got a credit card and I just figured I'll just do the minimum payments on that without really realizing what that meant. It, was, it wasn't it was really that much of a free spirited. It was really ignorance. And I guess I wasn't really knowledgeable enough to realize the damage that I was doing um, as far as getting in debt and, and how that actually going to it would affect you. My, I, I mean, I never really had the concept of an emergency fund or a, or a fail safe fund. Um, if anything happened, I would just use the credit card, but I would just use the credit card for anything. It didn't really, it didn't really matter to me because all I was paying attention was, you know, what's the minimum payment at every month, which wasn't really a representation of how much money you should really be paying in order to, to clear those, those charges. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't much of a free spirit, more than an ignorant spirit and just going through the motions. I guess I could probably define it as living by default. Like I wasn't really owning my life. It was more of the world around me and the, the things I saw other people do and me, you know, wanting that same stuff. I thought it was a feeling that I was for, uh, following. Like if I saw my neighbor, you know, get a new car, I was like, oh, you know, I, I would like to have a new car, you know, and I would go do it even if I couldn't really afford it. I was just, you know, use my credit card to do the down payment and then figure out how to do the payments later on and then just pay the minimum minimum uh, required payment on the credit card. I didn't really have a plan for neither myself or my family. It was just going through, you know, day by day, looking at what other w- others were doing and, and just try to catch up. I guess it was that, you know, catching up or, or keeping up with the Joneses type of mentality, really. How did you end up saving up enough for a house or a down payment on a house? So the nice thing there was my wife, uh, like I mentioned earlier, she was in the in the real estate business. So she knew about a bunch of different loans, uh, type of loans that we could qualify for. Uh, the first home we actually, uh, I think there was a plan back then that only had a three percent or maybe it was five percent down payment um so we went with that uh the first home we bought was in 2002 we ended up selling that in 2004 uh we did sell it for a profit so that basically helped us putting a um 10 percent down on the next home that we purchased and uh and it was it was basically that way i mean she she was really pivotal in our real estate experience as far as being able to to own for a home or save yeah. for a home. Gotcha. Projecting out, potentially you get to your goal of, of financial independence at 50, give or take. At some point, you're going to start drawing from this portfolio. Have you thought about how to make that mindset shift now that you've kind of gone from, you know, in your words, ignorant about finance to really having a great plan to executing that plan and then at some point you'll make the switch to withdraw from that. Yeah, so I'm I'm basically going to start withdrawing from anything that's in a taxable deferred account uh, whenever I get the chance. So right now, if I do, let's say if I do stop working at 50, I basically have nine and a half years before I can take money out of uh, 401ks and IRAs without a penalty uh, to, to be 59 and a half. So the plan would be to rely on the brokerage account at that time. Uh, Trying to stay, depending on the bracket that we end up in, uh, as far as taxes goes, my plan is uh, as soon as I can start doing Roth conversions, if those are still allowed, who knows what's going to be allowed. But right for right now, that's that's the plan. Um, and try to try to convert as much as I can in a, to a Roth. Uh, my idea is to start utilizing any money that's going to be left in a in a tax deferred account, anything that. You know, by age 72, I would be forced to take those or 70 now uh, or 72, I think it is uh, required minimum distributions. Uh, the less money I have in those type of accounts uh, is going to be better for me because that way I can really be in control of how much money I need to take out of, you know, a, a an IRA account. 
uh, versus the government telling me how much money to take out. So, so that's the plan. And it, it, based on the numbers that I see, if, if everything stays the same, if the returns stay from what I've seen in the last two years, since I really started paying attention, um, we should be in a pretty good spot where technically the brokerage account would really never go down to zero. Uh, cause as soon as we hit 59 and a half, I'll basically be able to piggyback on those 401ks or IRAs, um, at that time. And of course, I'm not considering Social Security. That would be a, a really nice bonus. Uh, the way I see Social Security is that's just going to pay for my Medicare whenever I get to that point. Uh, and whatever's left, you know, cherry on the top. Interesting. So do you plan on having any type of specific health care plan to bridge that gap? Or you do, do you really think you'll probably work up until you're eligible for, for Medicare? Um, so that's that's really something that I haven't decided yet. Um, I have looked at um, different healthcare options. Um, I mean, the option is always there to just get a not so stressful job in a similar, you know, similar type of company just to get that that health benefit. But I have seen some of the healthcare options. Now, I know based on the based on the income, you probably won't qualify for any type of um, of benefit or, or reduction in, in the in the premiums, but that's that's fine. I'm I'm actually anticipating between my wife and I to uh, to be spending. Let me take a look. Uh, about twelve hundred dollars a month. Like that's what I'm estimating we'll need every month just to cover uh, health coverage. That's not including you know any copays or anything like that. Just the basic premiums. So I, based on what I've seen right now, it should be less than that, but I'm just going with the most expensive option that I saw um, about six months ago and, and just budget for that. All right, Saul. So, well, let's uh, wrap up with some millionaire rapid fire questions before we get to final advice. Mm -hmm. What's the most expensive meal out that you've paid for? <laughs> um, probably per person, I would say maybe $250. Okay. What's the most expensive vehicle you've purchased? Well, um, I didn't end up purchasing because I leased it, but it was a BMW X3, which I should have never gotten. Uh, but it, it was one of those, I guess, midlife crisis moments of, but I feel like to serve this car, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, the, the lease payments on that thing were $790. Uh, ended up returning it because I later found out, you know, what it actually costs to maintain a BMW. So no, thank you um, for for everybody listening. The type of car you drive is not going to make traffic any better. And for me, I still use my car just to go to work and you know go wherever I need to do on the weekends. Any car is going to do the same thing. So uh, don't don't waste your money on a fancy car unless you can afford it. Okay, what's the most expensive uh, vacation or experience that you've paid for? Uh, we were able to go to a two-week trip uh, to Europe. Uh, it, I think right now, today's money, it, it was probably not that expensive, but back then it was for me when that was something that I just put on my credit card. Um, it was probably 14 years ago. We ended up putting about $15,000 in the credit card for that trip. Okay. What is yet to come in terms of a vacation or experience that you want to spend on? Uh, well, we I was hoping to uh, to take a month-long cruise, but now we're rethinking that uh, that option. Um, but probably probably if we can go back to Europe again when things get a little bit safer uh, for longer than just two weeks and just um, not take like a paid tour, but just be on your own time and, and you decide where you want to go and just take your time to really enjoy the, the scenes. Okay. Is there anything else that, you know, whether it be an item or experience that you're looking forward to spending money on in the future? Um, well, the, the best case scenario for, for both my wife and I would be if we, we could find a place near a lake and, and make that be our forever home. Uh, that would be awesome. Uh, that is something that we are keeping our, our eyes out. I mean, home prices are going through the roof right now, but uh, but that's something that we're keeping our eyes out. And if if the opportunity does come out, 
Uh, we may need to adjust our projections as far as being financially independent um, if that does come around, because that is something that we're both pretty passionate about. And it's definitely something that uh, keeps me motivated to uh, to continue to to invest and and keep those uh, returns coming. Awesome. What is worth spending the money to you? So I've learned now that what's really worth it is something that's going to leave pretty pretty good memories, something that you can look back to and say, I had a really good time there. Um, not necessarily on items, not necessarily on objects, but uh, spending time with family, you know, seeing your your nieces grow, your godchildren grow and 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 see them just grow not just as a as a human being but as a person and 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 just learn because you you learn from them as well just watching them grow and learn it's it's pretty amazing so the more that we can that we can have those type of experiences that's really what what we want to spend more of our money with not necessarily on just material things okay how much tv do you watch a week uh it actually gone down it's gone from watching TV now to listening to podcasts, um, so I think a week probably, I don't know, maybe seven hours. Um, Sundays are exceptions during football season. Um, I probably do seven hours just on Sunday, watching as many games as I can. But um, but that's you know just a couple of weeks, seventeen weeks now. Okay, what would be your final piece of advice for somebody who's just starting out on their journey on financial independence and wealth building? Yeah, so I think the main the main advice I think would be have have a plan. Um, you need to be able to understand what it is you want to do. Uh, so first first of all, you got to have a goal set in mind. Um, whether that is to retire in five years, twenty years, you know, say five hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, twenty million dollars. Just have that goal, and then create a plan on how you're going to get to that goal. But obviously, the most important thing is to actually act upon that plan. A plan is not going to get anywhere if you don't act upon it. Awesome. That's all. Just made million uh, millionaire status just recently. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you. It was great. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast with Clark Sheffield and Chase Mantinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website at millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.